which I usually forget to do. So excited my recording. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. I'm gonna um, just share a few slides when, um, and then I'm gonna introduce our speaker for the evening. I'm gonna ask everybody to make sure that they're on mute as we get started. I'm Rachel Power. I am one of the members of the um, volunteer board of directors with UXPA Boston. And let's get started. So this is our first meeting of 2023. So welcome to everyone. Thank you for attending. And this evening, we are going to hear from um, our fabulous speaker, Catherine Hermanson. And Catherine is not only my dear friend, but she is a colleague of mine. She lives in um, Vancouver, Canada. We work together at Realtor.com, where we're both principal designers. We're both content designers. I'm also now an inclusive uh, product designer and I work on the inclusive design team there at realtor.com. And Catherine is here tonight to talk to us about her really interesting career in US. <laughs> Thanks for going on mute. Um, so Catherine's career has um, gone through all different um, kind of interesting twists and turns, and she's now currently working as a content designer. So she's going to tell us all about how that career unfolded. So before we get to Catherine's presentation, we just have a few UXPA Boston um, housekeeping things to attend to. So I'll just have four slides to share with you. So we love to share um, information about upcoming conferences and events that are happening. UXPA International will be happening in person in June, and that will be in Austin, Texas this year. I believe tickets are already on sale, so you can look for those. There's also an interesting research summit happening that's um, being put on by UX360. And that is virtual, and that will be happening um, uh, in New York, and that's going to be happening um, coming up in February. Uh, there's also Ladies That UX, and the Boston chapter this month, actually uh, next Tuesday, is doing a really interesting lightning talk, and that is about designing for students' intrinsic motivation to learn. And Catherine Weber Hodelman, who's an accessibility consultant at DQ Systems, which is a really great accessibility consulting company that we actually really admire at um, 
at Realtor.com, along with Claire Wang, who's a lead UX designer at Curriculum Associates, are going to be doing the lightning talk. And that should be a really interesting event. And Ladies at UX is a really great um, kind of meetup group. And they have a book club in Chicago. They've got different uh, groups all over the country. So I encourage you to check them out. And I don't think you have to be a lady to join in the fun. So they're, um, they're really interesting. So that's going to be a, a great event uh, next week. Um, we also like to make sure that we are giving everybody the opportunity if they're attending one of these meetings and are looking for a job to give a shout out. So um, we'll take a couple minutes. And if you are looking for a job or if you're working at a company who's hiring, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to come off mute and let us know if you're looking for a job and what job you're looking, kind of job you're looking for. And then anybody um, who might be hiring, we'd love to hear from you too. And um, Craig is also going to share a link to our Google Jobs group in the chat. So go um, you know, check that out and feel free to, to copy that down. Um, so is there anybody who would be um, on the job market? Go ahead and give a shout out. Uh, I can go. Uh, my name is Abhishek Kulkrani, and uh, I'm currently looking for a new position. Um, I graduated from Bentley's Human Factors program this May, and I've been spending the last six months working as a UX design contractor at Fidelity Labs. I've done a variety of um, research work, both um, at my cur current at, at my um, role and basically through my sponsored class projects. The majority of my work has leaned toward the research side, um, both on the exploratory and usability side but I've also done work across the entire design spectrum. Since my contract has cur uh, currently expired um, last week, I'm currently on the market for new job opportunities and would really appreciate if anybody knows of anything or any leads that I can pursue. Great, thanks for sharing Abhishek. And maybe um, I can't see the chat right now because I'm in full screen on my Prezo, <laughs> but if you want to share your LinkedIn um, contact info in the chat, that would be super helpful too. So if anybody um, wants to reach out to you and um, anybody else, anybody else looking for a job and want to share their info. Hi, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Tanya Castro Donne, um, and I have been working um, primarily in graphic design roles for the past 10 plus years. Um, within that time, I've definitely had sort of a sprinkle of, of UI and UX work. Um, and I've realized that the the monotony of of graphic design work um, isn't challenging anymore. Um, and I really appreciate the you know really deep dive that you can get into with um, more user experience projects um you know being able to like research the ins and outs um test out your ideas um and be able to bring them to fruition with you know a lot more uh, um confidence that you're you're making things better for for users um, so yeah, I, um, have been looking for a while, but if anybody, um, has any leads, I'm currently, um, in the creative department at GBH. Um, but yeah, looking for more UX-based work. Thank you. Great. Tanya, that sounds, um, really <laughs> great. You've had some great, um, awakening and awareness. <laughs> so feel free to share your, your LinkedIn info in the chat as well. And, um, it sounds like you're on a great path. I got him just cards, like you know, to to change video game all the key. And let's go. Um. So, anybody else looking for a job who would like to um, share their info? How about anybody who might be hiring? Anybody looking for some folks at their job? Okay, let's move on then. And again, that um, Google Jobs group link should be in the chat. Okay, so let's 
get to the main event. And the main event is Kathy. So tonight's presentation is called A Design Career in Four Acts. And again, Katherine Hermanson, Principal Content Designer at Realtor.com, my esteemed colleague and friend. Um, Catherine's design career has spanned many years, 33 and counting and many different stages from graphic designer to web designer to product designer. This talk this evening is going to cover some of the things that she has learned along the way and how her work has changed, how it hasn't, and how all of it informs her latest work as a content designer. And so I'm going to stop sharing and we're gonna have a little transition as Kathy um, shares her presentation. So hold on a second. Okay, let's see if this works. No. So hopefully you're seeing just my slide presentation, not my speaker notes. Yes, perfect. Oh, awesome, awesome. Hello, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and, and uh, listening to my career exploration here. I really appreciate that. So what we're gonna go through tonight, a little bit of an intro to me and then the different acts in my career. So act one was print design, act two, web design, act three, UX designer, and act four, which I'm just starting, um, as Rachel mentions, is content design. So again, as Rachel mentioned the intro, I've been working as a designer for the last 33 years. I've had many titles, paste up artist, graphic designer, web graphic designer, web designer, webmaster, UI designer, UX designer, and most recently, content designer. Some of the companies I've worked for, um, the Georgia Strait, which is again, local to where I live uh, near Vancouver, uh, the uh, CBC Vancouver website, which is I set up the first one for Vancouver. Uh, that's the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation for those of you who don't know it. Um, Chancery Software is another company I worked for that later got bought by Pearson and I'm currently working for Realtor.com. Um, and just to sort of set the stage, um, I'm, calling you or talking from my office in White Rock, uh, British Columbia, which is south of Vancouver. Um, for anybody who needs it, I am a Caucasian woman. I have gray hair, I'm 57 years old, and I'm wearing glasses. Uh, print design, act one, uh, 1989 to 1996. So this is going way back. Um, so setting the stage, uh, a little bit of idea in terms of UX, the development of UX, uh, where I am in this point is I'm kind of, it's 1989, I'm just finishing art school, and I'm around this stage in sort of the UX development area, sort of just, just coming into the personal computing era. Uh, I went to art school at the Alberta, Alberta College of Art, um, majoring in graphic design. Uh, it's a four-year program. Uh, I did typography, I did brand, I did illustration, advertising, photography, animation, um, sort of everything I needed to kind of start my career. I was thinking I was going to go into graphic design. I was going to go into advertising, which I really enjoyed. Um, my father was in advertising. That was kind of like coming out of school. That was pretty much what I thought I was going to be doing. Um, I mean, we studied people like Paul Rand. Uh, Paul Rand, a designer's art. Um, so a lot of the, the principles around design, I don't think have changed that much. Um, design being a method of putting form and content together, if that's still the case. Um, it has multiple definitions. There's not no single one. It can be art. It can be aesthetic. Um, it's, it can be very simple, but it's also very, very complicated. Design, the design foundation that I have is something that's kind of carried through whatever career I've done. Um, so it's something I, I mean, Paul Rand is someone I encourage people to look up because he's done some really interesting things. He did the IBM logo. Uh, he did some amazing uh, advertising. This is an example from VW, which is, you know, think small, which is promoting these kind of small Volkswagens, which at the time when cars were 20 feet long and, and, and large, especially American cars, it was kind of like this, this new and fresh approach to things. So I definitely encourage people to look, look him up from a, from a design perspective. Um, but my first job when I got out of school was as a paste-up as a paste-up artist, and I'll explain what that is in just a second. At a radical hippie weekly, um, which was a fun place to work, it was a news and entertainment weekly uh, newspaper that was published in Vancouver. Um, and so, a paste-up artist, you know, is someone who prepares artworks, artwork for for books and publications and ads for print. Um, 
the preparation of artwork was a big thing. Now, this may seem strange that I'm talking about this in a chat about UX, but it took up a lot of our time. So anybody who was doing design work, or print work, and, and I know there's people that call who've done print work in the past, pre-computers, pre sort of that personal computer era, uh, paste up was a very labor intensive process. So I wanna just share a little bit of video with you what my life was like before computers. Now, hopefully the sound will come through of uh, version one of Photoshop, um, which I could see on my nine inch, you know, grayscale screen, which I loved. Um, and also, if you look at this in terms of like the, icon, the icons they're using, the terms they're using, so cut and paste, uh, crop, um, move things around, pencil tools, eyedropper, these are all kind of things that related to things in the physical world. So again, it was really easy to understand, okay, if I grab the crop tool, I can crop something. If I want to, you know, draw something, I can grab the pencil tool. So this was great. This was, I mean, looking back at it, I don't remember having, apart from reading the manuals, maybe uh, having any training in this, we just started using it. I mean, there was really very low friction. And another program um, was uh, PageMaker, which is, again, this is version 1.0 of PageMaker that you're seeing here, which not only like Photoshop allowed us to manipulate images, PageMaker allowed us to put things into layout, right? You know, as, as the speaker was talking about in the video, it's like sizing things and crop marks and putting in grids and all that kind of stuff um, was suddenly so much easier and so much more time saving, and we had so much more control over it. Um, so fantastic it was revolutionary for me so anybody who's not from that era um, may not remember how impactful it was but for someone like myself it was it was huge and it's still I have very fond memories of you know the first computer that I had which was an S, a Macintosh SE30 uh, I think it was 128 megabits of uh, you know computing power um, and how much I loved it and how revolutionary it was for me so that was kind of act one which was just that digital transformation from taking something that I, you know, was very labor intensive that I had to do a lot of it in my job. It was like whatever design I was doing, I was also doing the artwork for um, taking that and, and making it so much easier and making it something that as I look back, you know, as a UX professional, I, and I realized like how much they really thought about the user and how much they really understood what the user was trying to do. Um, you know, that made a, a huge impression on me. So that's sort of the end of act one. Act two, which is, you know, post, you know, I've got, a, I've got a computer now, I'm doing my own digital layouts, it's great, I'm still doing a lot of print design, is, is web design. So that was kind of the, the thing that followed next after that sort of personal computing revolution. Um, and it was Web.10, as we call it now. Back then it was just a web, we didn't have a name for it like that. Um, but it was kind of, it was referred to as kind of the read-only version of the web. You know, the role of the user was kind of limited. You know, they were reading information. We were providing information. They were kind of one-way communication. Um, they're not really given, it's not really interactive or not terribly interactive. Um, so I think of like static websites and personal sites at that time. So this is something I was, I was very interested in. Um, and in 1997, this is about where I was kind of getting started. I was seeing websites, you know, I was like, because I had a computer and I had the internet because I was using it to type transfer files and things. I was like, oh, okay, the web is, the web is kind of important. It's going to stick around. So because I saw this changing, because I'd been sort of very embedded in the print area, I was like, okay, I need some more, I need some more training on this. I mean, this is something as much as I could picked up computers fairly quickly, computers specifically kind of programs written for me, um, I really need to take some time and study this kind of new area. So I went, I went and took a new media training, uh, which covered things like information architecture. And there's a lovely, um, if you're familiar with it, the lovely information architecture for the World Wide Web. The Polar Bear book was one of the first books I read on this. Um, I studied human computer interaction, video editing, DVD-ROM authoring, which may sound weird. Actually, that was the big thing at the time because HTML was, uh, couldn't really support a lot. The web was slow. You, you couldn't have a lot of graphic intensive videos and things on the web. People were doing DVD-ROMs um, and that was giving them that sort of multimedia uh, rich kind of experience. So my expectation coming out of this program actually would I be doing DVD-ROM authoring more than I would be doing the web or HTML. So my first job at a software company, which is kind of after my training, was at a company called Chancery Software, which is later 
are bought by person school systems and they did um, student information systems. So this is ways of uh, keeping track of grades and activities and things for students. Um, most of my work, you know, I was working in the marketing department um, and most of my work was still print, um, but I was also creating marketing websites now because that was something that people were looking for. And this was like, oh, you can do print. Can you do a website? Sure, I can do a website. Uh, email campaigns. And I was actually doing some DVD-ROM work. So that was that was good. I was kind of glad that I got to put that into practice. Um, but at this time, like I said, most of my time was focused on just getting information out. So anything to do with the web was, it was like, put our brochure on the web, basically. I mean, that was kind of the, the most important thing. I'm going to go back a little bit. lost my space. Anyway, I'll keep talking. So the most important thing was kind of like still print, right? I was still like that was the that was the focus um, towards the end of that time. Um, but I was doing more stuff because it was a software company. I was getting kind of requests for like, well, can you make our screens look a little better in the application? Can you help with, with some icons? Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, I can do that. I mean, I've, sure. Um, it was kind of very superficial level of what they're asking for, but it was really interesting to kind of work with engineers, work with that group of people who were producing the products that I was helping to promote. So I, I was, it was like, it was kind of like an aha moment for me is like, I really kind of enjoyed working on products versus um, doing the stuff that I was doing in the marketing area. So act three, which is what I, is when I sort of became a UX designer. Um, and also around this time, this is web.20. So the web is becoming more sophisticated. Um, this is like the read write era of the web. So we're actually getting more two-way communication, more interaction, um, you know, and, and this is sort of when users could become content producers, right? They could, they could create their own stuff. They were doing web applications like Facebook and YouTube and Flickr, which is not around anymore, but I remember it for photographs, Twitter, all that kind of stuff was actually allowing people to kind of create their own content, upload it on the web, share it. Um, so it was much more, the stuff that was happening now and in, in this, this era was much more built around the users, you know, producers and companies like software companies really needed to find ways to engage and to enable and engage them because they were out there doing stuff and they had higher expectations. So again, my first job at a software company, not in the marketing department, um, I was hired by Realer.com, where I currently still work, um, to work on a couple of their products, um, a couple of their marketing products. So, you know, it was still marketing, but not quite. Um, and this is, again, as I mentioned, my aha moment when I was hired by this company and I was working on the product instead of the promotional materials. And I really enjoyed working on the product. I really enjoyed thinking about it from the user's perspective and kind of building things that people use, like tools that people use. Much like, you know, I really enjoyed working with Photoshop and PageMaker and the things that I showed you previously, because I mean, this is cool. This is stuff that kind of helps people do their work and do the tasks they need to do. Um, so as, as I mentioned, I was working on Top Producer, uh, which is a CRM for real estate agents. It allows them to manage their contacts, it allows them to send up, uh, to stay in touch with them with like drip campaigns and email campaigns. And it was quite a vast and big program. And I also worked on a program called Top Marketer, which allowed people to do online um, direct mail and emails. Um, as well as creating like listing alerts for new listings are created. So I was doing the software that allowed them to set up these campaigns that allowed them to kind of send that message out. Um, and also when I first started like at this company, now top producer of the CRM had been around for quite a while, um, but this was the first time that they were actually doing it online. So this is like the web point web 2.0 kind of enablement where they're actually the software was something you logged into on the web and prior to that it was something you got on a dvd or you got on a cd or you got on floppies and you put it on your computer and you kind of worked you know just off your computer and that was it so this is a big change for them as well now software development again my first experience with software development i've been working on it i'm working on these products was waterfall um and basically you know waterfall it was Teams were kind of required to stick to a very specific set of requirements. Um, it was it was a lengthy process, so the requirements were kind of worked out, and they were like they were very comprehensive. Um, and my involvement was was basically kind of at the requirement and design level. Um, but it prioritized being being bringing a complete product to market, meaning it could take years um, before teams could have a finished product at hand. So at this time, we might do one or two releases a year. 
right? So it's very slow. Um, so it was, it was kind of like something that, it, again, I was really only involved in this, this top part, you know, my area. I would do, I would do some screens. I'd work with the, the product manager. Um, and then I really didn't hear much about it until maybe three or four months later, maybe longer, where maybe engineering has picked it up and they might have a question about something, or they've decided to drop the feature entirely. You know, the, the thing with Waterfall is something like this, and especially because we weren't getting a lot of feedback from our users at this point, is sometimes we would, we would pick a feature. Um, a good example is we, for Top Producer, we wanted to do a, an email feature. So Top Producer is about managing your clients. Well, we could have basically create like Outlook within Top Producer, like you could have your email and you could send email and you could send, you know, all sorts of different things to your contact list because your contact list was in Top Producer. And we spent months designing it and, and even longer building it. We hadn't released it yet. And at the end of that process, um, they actually started to talk to some users and talk to some people. And most people were saying, you know, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use the email feature because I have Gmail or I have Outlook. And I just would rather you just integrate those things so that I can use them and use Top Producer at the same time. So that was like months of effort that we just scrapped because it was like, oh, you know, we don't think even people will even use it. So that's kind of this on the, the downside of things like waterfall. So Fortunately, we also began to move from Waterfall to Agile. Now I bring up Agile, I am not a programmer per se, I am not, but Agile was something that really changed how I worked with engineering and product um, because it was iterative, because it was happening very quickly. So you were doing things, you were testing things, you were, you were delivering them and you were, you were doing them again. So I had to be much more, work much more closely with both product and engineering because we were changing things all the time. Oh, this didn't work. Or what about this? So there was a lot more uh, discussion. There was a lot more kind of like collaboration, um, you know, because it was like it had to move to make things move quickly. Um, so it was one of those things that changed because change things for me, because actually in Agile, it's really important to focus on the user and the user needs because it's, it's, it's something that grew out of an engineering group's um, kind of frustration with companies that were you know, so focused on the planning and the documenting, the documenting of the software development cycles that they lost sight of what really mattered, which was pleasing their customers. So like the example I gave you is we spent months building out a feature that our customers didn't want and wouldn't have paid for it to get. So that's frustrating. It's frustrating for an engineer to work so hard on a feature to make it work and then have it be rejected or have it be something that people don't use. So in the early sort of early 2000s, there was a group of engineers who kind of got together and kind of wrote this agile manifesto um, and these kind of principles around agile, but it was the idea that it was individual interactions over processes and tools, working product over comprehensive documentation. Uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan, because sometimes you stick to the plan because that was the plan you set out for a year. So we're just going to do it. Um, so it, it gave people a lot more freedom and a lot more kind of like uh, ownership of what they were building. Um, and focusing on the customer, you know, meant focusing on the user experience. So this in turn, you know, for people who had some skills in this area, um, that's what we needed. We needed more people with skills in UX to create designs and flows that actually focused on what the user wanted to do. So that was, again, that kind of motivated me to kind of learn more about this area, do more in this area, and there was a business need for it. So in the UX design world, um, this, is, this is sort of a chart that talks about the kind of the stack of the user interface. Um, and for me, whereas I was initially kind of working in this sort of visual design area, you know, and if you think of the full stack of, 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 of software, it's not just a visual design, it's user needs um, and objectives, specs, content requirements, interaction design, information architecture, uh, uh, information design, which is like uh, interface design and navigation design. It's a whole bunch of things that need to be done to deliver that experience. So I went from working from kind of just kind of doing screens to kind of like covering that full stack and being involved in that full stack of stuff. So I was now talking to customers. We were showing them mock-ups early on. We would have, we'd have long calls. We'd have, we'd bring people in and do focus groups and kind of ask them to use the software. We were like really talking to them. And I was really much more involved in trying to understand what their, the problems are they're trying to solve. 
um, to sort of build better applications that would do that for them. And so that was kind of like the end of, you know, act three, which is UX design and, and you know, product design is you know, really doing stuff across, across the full sort of stack of development of products, being, being kind of having a seat at the table, working closely with the product and engineering to kind of figure out what we wanted to build and why, um, you know, and, and kind of driving that a little bit. And as far as it just being before where you kind of get like a directive from above and this is what you have to build. It was like, okay, this is why we think this is the future we should work on. This is why it's important. Also getting more data about how people were behaving um, and talking to people, right? Really understanding what their needs were. This is also the time I became a front engineer for a very short period of time. Um, this is basically born out of the need um, to better translate my designs onto the web. So front-end design development was not really a specialty now yet. I mean, now there's whole teams, just people, there's whole skill sets that are involved with front-end design. Um, but back then when I was working on this, most engineers were really focused on connecting the back end to the database, making sure the interactions that are happening on the front end were saved properly and functioning properly. They didn't really have the time or perhaps even the training um, or even the tools at this point to kind of deliver like, you know, if I wanted rounded corners, if I wanted different kinds of things than UI that look different from kind of static elements, it was difficult for them. It was difficult for them to have the time to do that. So I started doing it. I learned how to do, you know, you know how to use your CSS and use JavaScript to kind of like make that, that front end, that interface layer um, uh, friendlier uh, more appealing, uh, that kind of stuff. So I, and that was actually a really good experience for me to do that because, um, one working with engineers really improved my development, my, my engineering skills, um, and help inform my design. I had a better sense of what's practical and realistic and also when to push for th new things, like an understanding how they worked and understanding what could be done allowed me to kind of push things a little bit further and ask for stuff that perhaps I wouldn't have in the past or I would have simply accepted, oh, they said, no, we can't do that. Um, it also meant that I became part of the engineering team and I was governed by some of the, the same rules. I was checking in code. I was trying not to break the build, which I managed to do frequently. I was kind of learning all that stuff. And for, for, you know, for the engineers, they were kind of seeing what I did. You know, they were like seeing, oh, it's, she's not just sort of designing this off in a silo and, and saying, build it. You know, we're working back and forth. We're having that dialogue between what's possible, what we want to do, why we're doing it. Because often engineers didn't know why we're doing a specific feature, why we weren't doing something else. Like they weren't getting that voice. And now they had that voice. We wanted their opinion. We wanted them to, their, their input on the designs that we're doing. So, I mean, they wanted, I wanted them to understand why we were doing it. So that was a lot more, you know, kind of integration and embedding with, with the different um, engineering teams. So that was, um, that was a great time for me. I don't do front-end development anymore. It's gone way past my skill set. Um, I couldn't keep up with it now if I tried, but uh, I really am appreciative of that, that I had the opportunity to kind of do that while I, while I was designing. And even to the point where I was designing in code, because we were doing some things so quickly, I would just do the layout directly into the, the application we were using to create the programs. Um, and kind of like stepped away from even like doing a lot of elaborate designing for it. Okay, we're coming up on act four. I feel like I'm talking really, really fast um, because I tend to do that. <laughs> act four is content design. Um, now this is, this is new. This is new for me. This is something that is always kind of part of what I did, but I never really had a name for it. I didn't know it was a thing or a discipline. It was just like, you know, content is part of what we do. Um, Bill Gates said in 1996 that content was king. Well, that's, that's true. Um, you know, but it's become, I think, more relevant now because there is so much out there. There's so much competition, you know, people spend so much of their time online. Um, and if websites and apps, you know, they can't afford to be clunky and difficult um, because people will just drop them. They'll go to somebody else, a competitor that does it better, right? I mean, this, you know, it's easier to use. I prefer that how this thing works over how your site works. Um, and it's not necessarily because the content is better, but it's because the design and the content is better or the design and the functionality is better. Um, so yeah, so it's it's really important to kind of like uh, have both content design, uh, to think about content design the way we're thinking about everything else about design. We have to think about the words. We have to think about all of that stuff um, and not leave it till the end. 
So what do content designers do? I mean, just like a UX designer, I mean, they make products easier for people to understand and use. Uh, you know, our focus is presenting information that users need in a clear, inclusive and accessible way. To do this, we research user needs and language and then use, adapt and design with words, format, layout, structure, governance, strategy. Well, I've, I've come from that world. Right. That was kind of all the stuff that I was doing before, but my focus is more on like the words that are the, the conversation that is happening between uh, interface and a person. So if you think about it as being a conversation, you want to have natural language, you want to speak human, right? You don't want to speak like a computer. Um, you don't want to use things like buttons like submit, you know, it's like, well, that's a very computer kind of word to say. Um, and what we do is we kind of look for, for problems too. And when we're, when we're going through designs and working with designers and working with um, product uh, uh, managers, we're looking for holes for things that might not work um, as a conversation. Again, as a conversation, as that, that, that sort of dialogue between somebody with a person and an application, um, things that may not belong where they are and things that could you know, be improved. And you know, this, what I'm showing you here is that yeah, without content design, apps and website would look like this. We need the words. Okay, we need to have things that explain what's going on. It's important. So why did I choose it? Again, as I mentioned, like content, the words, I mean, it was always part of my design process. I, I didn't use, I try not to use Lorem Ipsum for things in layouts when I was creating mockups and prototypes. You had to have the text there. You couldn't test something. You couldn't show it to uh, a customer and say, how do you think this would work without having some sort of copy in there or some sort of content. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to sort of like, I would use my designs and the words that I was using is to sort of show what kind of meaning and intent I had with this design, you know, and I was fortunate, um, and I have been fortunate to work with a lot of really skilled technical writers and copywriters who would help me. So they would, you know, I would say, this is my intent, this is what I want to do, and I could learn from them in terms of the types of craft they would apply to sort of have that, that those words and that, that, that meaning come across the way I intended it to. Um, and as with my other career shifts, there was a, there was an unmet need. There was a business need for this, you know, as, as realtor, the company that I work for, realtor.com I work for scaled in size, there was more designers and more products and more features being developed at a much rapid rate. So go back to agile, everyone's doing stuff. Everyone's doing, creating things. That's great. Um, but they're not always thinking about the kind of conversation they're having with people. They're not always thinking about the words that are, that are on those, those, those uh, interfaces. They're, they're, not, they're developing things so quickly. And with no real content strategy in place, you had a variety of people kind of creating content. You know, there was designers, product managers, engineers, copywriters, lots of people were doing stuff. We're just like, I need an error message here. I'll just put something in. Um, and so there's that lack of consistency. Right, so just like we're, we um, now use things like um, design systems to make sure that our components in a web in a web application are consistent and look the same and feel the same, um, we need to apply that same kind of process and methodology to the words and the content that we're using, so that we have the same voice and tone throughout. That we are considerate of where people are in their journey when they're using our application, so we have the kind of the appropriate tone. Because um, we want to avoid some of the examples I have here uh, is just having, you know, really awkward content that does not really respect uh, where the user is or doesn't really help them. I mean, nobody wants to see, oopsie, your credit card was declined. Uh, that, that someone's attempt to be humorous uh, and friendly at a time which may be very serious. Um, or the next one is about uh, signing up for a newsletter and and saying, oh, you know, yes, yes, I'd like to sign up. No, I'm scared. That's kind of insulting to the user. It's not really, you know, a, it's kind of like trying to bully them into doing something. So these are things we want to avoid. These are things we don't want to do. Um, and you have to really think about the content. And again, that conversation, if you think of a UI as someone who is talking to you, um, then it's like, okay, I want that conversation to be friendly. I want them to be sympathetic to my needs and understand what I'm trying to do. And I don't want them to get in my way. So what we're kind of doing now at realer.com, because I mean, I've kind of been in the role of a content designer for the past year, um, but the company also is, you know, the company agreed, again, the business need, um, it needed content designers. They were, they were realizing that, you know, again, to stand out, we have a lot of competitors. We have like a lot of competitors in our space, in the real estate search space. Um, and, you know, 
our, is our content as consistently good as they are? I mean, we, we needed people to kind of think about that strategy. Um, so, you know, they hired a lead content designer. That's not my role. Um, and then they gave me an opportunity because this is something that I've expressed a lot of interest in. I've done stuff. I brought up the fact that we kind of were missing this. This is a gap. Um, they gave me the opportunity to explore it as a kind of a uh, explore it as a kind of a career, which has been great. So the last sort of year has been really trying to focus on what it means to do that, to help people. Um, because I was doing writing in the past, it was like, it was just, I was doing more of that, um, more education. Uh, we were doing like office hours with our designers, because again, there's only two of us and a lot of people, like 40 designers that we're working with. So it's more like, how can we scale this? How can we educate people? How can we give them some tools that will allow them to kind of uh, be more consistent? So creating like a style guide so that everyone uses the same kind of terminology and the language um, and giving them examples and good examples and bad examples. I mean, we're trying to get to you know, what this sort of illustration shows is to be a sort of a full stack. You know, if you go back to that full stack I showed you previously about product and software development is having people who kind of like support all these different levels, the scope. So we have people like content designers and strategists working on scope and structure and surface so that everything that we're doing, it has that, has that you know, ref reflects um, someone kind of reviewing it, making sure it's appropriate, making sure it's the right thing uh, to be saying, the right tone to be taking at that time. So we're, we're trying to get there, we're not there yet. Um, because again, it, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different stuff happening. So we're, we're at least trying to scale up to the point where we can hit, give people tools to do it, to do it better and have a better understanding of what they need to do, um, and why it's important and why it does make a difference in that user experience. Taking a breath. See, I told you I talk fast. Um, and so, and just sort of wrapping up sort of the content design space. These are some of the resources that I've done. I've done a lot of reading. I've done a lot of online training uh, to kind of help me um, understand and focus on this a bit more. Um, and happy to share this with anybody who is interested in reading more. These are all excellent, excellent people. There's a lot of wonderful people doing work in this area. It's really grown in the last 10 years um, from being kind of a bit of a wild west area to being much more of a discipline and much more of a, a defined practice. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of wrapping up where I'm at. Um, but happy to talk and answer questions um, on my long rambling thing here. Thank you, Kathy. That was so interesting. And it's a really great story of what it takes to become a content designer, because most content designers do a lot of interesting things before getting into content design, because all of those skills are necessary to become a great content designer. So, um, does anybody have any questions for Kathy? And feel free to either um, go ahead and ask them aloud, or if you're shy, you can also type them into the chat. I have a question for Kathy, if, I, if you don't mind. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it's amazing. I am, a, I guess I would say, an old school designer like you. Uh, transitioned a couple of places, did a lot of things. I guess you exemplify the fact that design is a multifaceted career path where you have to wear many hats, mm -hmm. right? And you exemplify that. My question to you is, can you talk a little bit about any trepidation, any fear, any uh, that you might've felt in transitioning from one discipline to another? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, every time I made a transition, I, did, I, I thought that, you know, is this gonna be sustainable? Um, is this gonna go away? Um, so there was, there was always that, but there was always this overriding curiosity and desire to kind of try it out. I think part of what drove me is I, <laughs> there was a bit of control aspect. Like I learned how to program, like when I was talking about becoming a friend and engineer for a while is because I wanted to control my designs. Um, I really like, I really like anything that gave me a little bit more ownership of what we were doing. So even though there was a risk there and, and, and let's be honest, there's been tech bubbles at first, there's been restructuring and things that are and things that are happening now so that elimination could happen I could I could be moving on to something else but I do find that having more experience 
gives me more things that I could do if, if I had to change my job, you know, so I'm always open to having another experience because then I can talk about it. And uh, I did, uh, I was doing a career accelerator workshop with Scott Kuby, which I highly recommend anybody who's interested in UX uh, writing. Um, and I mapped all the things I touched in my life, all the different things I tried and, all, and it, was, it was massive. There was a whole bunch of things, not that I was good at all, of them, but it's something that I can reflect back on, at least say, I understand how that works. Um, and what the point of that is. So I, I, for me, it's like, it always pays off to take a risk, I guess is what I'm saying. So if I don't do it because I think it's risky, then my argument to myself is like, my risks have always paid off. Stay, playing safe and staying and doing the same thing didn't, if that helps. No, it helps immensely. Thank you for saying that. It also validates you as a practitioner, right? Because you were a developer, you've done a lot of different design functions. I think you come up, you come across as a person who is skilled. So there's a little bit of lack of questioning, maybe in a reservation from a developer side, you know, to ba basically trust you in in the direction you might want to take a product. So I think that's all good. I, I I commend you for, again, for being a uh, a person who wore many hats and continues to aspire to wear many hats. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. That was a great question. Hey, Kathy, this is Kristen. I have a quick question for you. Coming back to something you mentioned a few moments ago about content strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be a trend, and I'm sure you've seen this, where if I go on a website, I'm prompted, I get a pop-up box that says, you know, enter your, your mobile phone number and let us text you or let us email you, subscribe to our newsletter, and your options are either yes and not no, but something like not right now or maybe later. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, you know, I always like to give value for things. So if someone's asking you for information, I think you have to give them some value up front before you do that. So, and this is, I mean, I can't say it's a battle I've won, but it's the type of discussion I have when, when even on our site, we have features that you have to like register. And even though it's free, um, you have to register to get access to them. And I think most people are very savvy about that. They're like, well, I know if I give you my personal information, you're going to, you're going to email me and you're going to spam me and you're going to call me into, and I don't want that. So I'm, I'm not in favor of that. I understand why from a business perspective, they're trying to kind of collect that information, but I think at least you have to give them a proper exchange of value. So if they want to want your information, give them something first that makes you show what your value is before asking for that. So I'm definitely opposed to like, you know, blocking people and saying, well, we have to give you something, you know, give me something first before we give you something of value. I think you should flip it, give them something of value. So they want to stay in a relationship with you. Here, here, thank you. You're welcome. So we have a question in the chat, Kathy, um, at each turn, how did you recognize that it was time for a change? Any rules of thumb to share? How did I recognize? I mean, a lot of that became out of like, again, I, I, I work to live. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm an, uh, uh, constantly employable. So if I saw an opportunity like front end development, like UX design, like switching over to digital, you know, anything that I saw as an opportunity to kind of make me uh, more profitable as a person, um, I would gravitate towards that because it's just like, oh, this is where things are going. That's why I, want to, I wanted to learn, I went back to school and learned about sort of like uh, new media, which is like the DVD authoring and HTML because I am attracted to the shiny new thing a total, total disclosure on that. I have far too many devices and all that other stuff. I'm an early adopter of a lot of things. So if it's shiny and new, I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. And then if I could see that there was actually a career path opening up, well, that's also interesting as well. So it's like, that's kind of, that was the nudge. It's just like, I talked about content design, that kind of unmet need that I see where I currently work at realtor.com is like, oh, can I do this? I can see that we need content design. I can see that as I do research on it, that that's a discipline and that's a practice. Um, can I do it? You know, so, so part of it is an interest on my part, but also I see it as a way of like, oh, well, that's, you know, there's a gap there. We've got lots of graphic, you know, we've got lots of designers. We've got lots of UX designers, but we don't have any content designers. Well, that's an opportunity for me. And let me know if I answered your question because I can tend to get 
sidetracked. I'm easily sidetracked by shiny things, as I mentioned. Tanya has raised her hand. Hello. Um, oh. Thanks so much, Kathy. This has been fascinating. Um, one of the questions I have, and it's something that I feel like I've been struggling with in my own sort of like attempt at a career transition. Um, how do you like go? Oh, you just went on mute. Oh, I don't know how I did that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, how do you go about, um, you know, convincing others that your past design experience still um you know makes you qualified in in some way for that transition um yeah like how how do you navigate like actually going for the transition and, and succeeding I think I mean like you know as you you know I know you're a graphic designer because you I know you, you talked about um kind of wanting to make that transition yourself to more UX design is I think the more that you can sort of like reframe what you've done from the perspective perspective of UX, that will help, right? Because as a designer, let's just take design, let's don't care what the, what, how you're delivering it. As a designer, you're a problem solver and a communicator. So for me, I always focused on those strengths um, to kind of inform the transitions I'm making. So when I transitioned to content design, I was always doing UX design. I understood a lot of the stuff that a content designer does as well. I mean, I need to brush up on some skills for writing. I mean, Rachel and I had a little chat before this meeting and she kept pointing on all my typos. Um, so there's lots of stuff that I can do on a skill perspective, but I already had that perspective on uh, creating things for people to use, on solving problems for people. And I think that I'm sure if you look at the work that you've done and you put it in that sort of framework, that lens is like, this is how I solve problems. This is how I helped people do things. This is how I help uh, people do tasks and whether whatever, regardless of what kind of print design you work is, I would just try and reframe it around that um, because you're already doing it. You know what I mean? You're already doing that kind of stuff. It's just reframing how you tell that story. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yes, and um, in the comments, we had another question from um, a follow-up question from Rana about um, how to manage risk when you're making those career transitions. Um, I did freelance for a long time. So I would have a full-time job and I did freelance work as well. Not that I'm advocating that that's, that's practical for everyone, but I always had that as my backup. So I, I continue doing print design and even web design, kind of like just got a brochure where web, web design for a long time, um, pretty much up until maybe the last 10 years. Um, so I always had another job. I always had a side gig um, going on because I just felt that just in case something happened, I could keep doing, you know, I could go back to doing print design. I could go back to doing some other kind of thing. I could, I, I for a while I was doing WordPress implementations for people um, on their websites because I understood how to do them. I'd done enough of them for various clients. And so I always kept a bit of a side gig, gig going on. And again, I don't know if that's practical for everyone, but that is what kind of what I did to kind of offset um, the what ifs. I took a risk and it failed. Hey, Kathy. Oh, Hi, uh, Tom Rue here. I'm a, uh, also a content designer. I go by the title of a content strategist in my work, but what, awesome. I would love to hear what mistakes have you made along the way that others might benefit from? Oh, mistakes. I've made so many mistakes. <laughs> Breaking the build. There's a mistake. Did that a lot. Um, I didn't, I don't feel like I made mistakes in terms of my career directory, trajectory sometimes. Um, I really wished I invested in a lot of software applications early on instead of just dismissing them like Facebook and Apple because uh, I'd be rich right now. Um, I think for me, uh, where I where I falter is, is pushing myself in a way that's uncomfortable. So even though I did transitions to like different job areas, um, I could have done more like this. 
public speaking. I could have done more reaching out to people and educating and helping to educate. Um, I did do some mentoring kind of later on and I th and thought maybe about teaching, but I didn't do that. And I think, I think that's really helpful. I think this, 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 even just doing this, if kind of going through my experiences and trying to sort of like create a story about it and trying to say what I learned about it, um, that sort of introspective stuff, I don't do enough of. And so to me, I mean, I don't know if that's, that's a mistake, but it's, I think it's like that self-examination um, is something that I tend to rush to like, oh, the next thing or the next thing I have to do. And I don't take time to reflect on it. And I'm going to move my slide because I actually put in a quote in here about that because someone sent that to me and I thought, oh, this is tr so true. I don't spend enough time going back and really digesting things that I've learned um, I tend to sort of jump to the next thing and start working on it. Um, and sometimes, you know, I've, I've, I've forgotten things that, you know, I and that it comes back to me, oh, I should know that. You know, I should know that we should be talking to the users first, just about concepts before we even show designs and wireframes. I should know we shouldn't jump into high fidelity designs and still I've done that um, instead of just doing sketches and doing that kind of work up front. So I think, and this quote is something that, definitely is a mistake that I've made in the past where I haven't really taken that time to reflect what I've done and what I've accomplished. Hi, Kathy. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi, this is Kinsella. Can you hear me very well? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure because I may have an issue with my laptop, but <laughs> I just kind of go with it. Um, I come more from a, a web product management background, but as you've described, I see that there's been some overlap in my career and with uh, both the product management, the UX, uh, UI, and development as well. Um, I dabbled in a few um, development, front end development courses having uh, taken, oh goodness, taken some programming courses early on in my career back like in college and then even when things just first came out with the web and all that, um, really kind of grown up with it. But one thing um, I ran into when I was doing some development courses was, you know, I did the CSS and the HTML and the JavaScript. And then I started getting into responsive. And it started getting to be like a little bit over my head and much more difficult, sort of like what I equate to like a foreign language, because <laughs> it is a language. Yep. Um, I was curious, have you had any, any experiences in your uh, career where you're pivoting, um, but where you, may have run into something that's just not quite the right fit and so you had to like pivot and change what you were doing yeah i had to make a decision so the the, the front end engineering one is is a, is a good example i was doing enough of that 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 the people you know, where the the teams and things that are working on and my manager was saying well what do you want to do do you want to do front engineering or do you want to do ux design and i was enjoying both and I was probably doing more front engineering than I was doing UX at that time. So I had to really stop and kind of like, like, and really think about what I wanted to do. And your point about responsive and about the way things were changing is like, I didn't know that I would have the capacity to stay on top of that um, and had the energy to stay on top of that. Um, and I still really liked doing UX and doing things like, like, sketching things out and kind of figuring out what the problems we're trying to solve and kind of getting to to know and understand the people that we're solving doing these you know making these applications for and I still really enjoyed doing that so I did make that choice I mean I did make the choice of to move away from front-end development and and stick with that of the UX career path but it was there was a while there that and I was kind of getting some pressure actually to stay in front-end design uh, front-end engineering because they actually needed people um, as well because they didn't have a lot of people doing it. So there was some pressure on me to kind of like, yeah, you know, you're doing really well at this. Maybe you should just keep going. Um, and but I did make this, and I, and I think it was the right one for for what where my interests are and where my sort of passion is. Uh, it was less about. I mean, doing that was great because I could deliver stuff. But as soon as I got someone who could do it better than me, I was like, great, take it. It's yours. I'm okay with that. So I think that was kind of what helped me make that made that decision. But that was that was for a while there. That was kind of there was a lot of kind of 
there's a lot of kind of stress around that, making that that choice. Yeah, thanks. It's a good example. I was thinking of just another one that was even earlier on in my career. Um, I started working with development, not actually doing coding, but um, doing uh, working more around the testing. Mm -hmm. And oh, development just loved that. They just ate it up because they said, great, we've got somebody who's kind of like checking on our work and making yep. sure things work. And, and at one point, one of the managers, the development has actually wanted to pull me out of what was then our web product management team and pull me into his team. And, and then for me to be like their, their core tester. And I was like, uh, and I had the same thing. I had to make a decision because I said, mm, it's not the right feel. I like mm -hmm. more involved with the user experience, understanding what the customer's needs are and understanding how we could provide products that would help them in their business. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's understanding what, who you are, you know, and that's some of the things you have to try it to see. Uh, it's interesting because product management was another area that people were like, oh, you should go into product management. And I'm like, sure about that. Um, but because, I mean, because I was more participating more in sort of like helping to define what the, the product was and helping to sort of, to sort of, to work on that from the planning stage, I think that's why that came up. Again, I don't know that that's necessarily what I want to do. I do know some designers who did go that path. They become product managers and do a lot of stuff and do it really well. So same same kind of thing. Any other questions from anyone or any more questions? I don't see any more questions in the chat. Oh, I do see one. Um, what kind of user testing do you do around the content you are designing from Nancy Shop? Oh, good question. Um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Um, I know, again, sort of pre-COVID times, you could do content testing where you, you know, gave people the content and they would highlight the things that they're they were confused about um, a little harder to do right now we do do things where we get people to read the content we get them you know maybe it's uh maybe it's something like in a cta and we give them a variety of different ctas um and we use some a platform called usertesting.com a lot or user interviews is another one um and we just get them to sort of like talk aloud and kind of go through what they think something meant, um, what they think it would do, like it was a CTA, uh, longer form content, we might get them to read it through and then ask them, um, you know, what they retain from it, um, what you know, were their questions answered going into it. So a lot of it is a bit more remote now because just because of, of COVID and also because of like where people are. Um, but that's one of the ways that we're kind of testing content. And sometimes we're just like, I said, if it's like a CTA or something, we just give them multiple versions and maybe we do like an AB test. Sometimes we do things actually on production. So that's our live website. And we try different pieces of content to see if it gets more activity, more clicks, more, more that type of thing. Um, I got a little bit of follow-up on that. Um, do you um, also test across um, languages? Our site is not is only in one is only in one language, so we don't. I haven't done that type of testing before. I don't know, Rachel, if you've done that in the past with some of the work that you've done. Um, we didn't do a lot of content at, in PayPal. We were at PayPal. We were in like eighty two countries, but we didn't do a lot of um, content testing. Yeah, that's interesting because it seems like that you can just take words and they're good words in one language and they're, they they may be interpreted, they, you know, the tone especially different mm -hmm. in another language. Yeah, we had um, look, we had a huge team that we did um, a globalization and localization team. So we were making sure that everything was being translated locally and it was, you know, specific to that language, that area, that region. So it was culturally appropriate. Interesting. Thank you. Any other questions for Kathy?
Okay. I think we're going to end it there then. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, thank you, of course, to Kathy for this wonderful presentation and sharing her excellent story and her journey of her fascinating career with all of us. Um, I fortunately will get to see her at work tomorrow virtually. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> but thanks for coming you. to Vancouver and you're welcome anytime. Come I on. would love to come to Vancouver. I love Vancouver, one of my favorite cities. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for attending. This was such a great turnout and we will um, be back again next month. We're going to have a great presentation um, with Lori um, Favor, Favor, Bomb, Favor Bomb, and she is a uh, very senior UXer at Fidelity and she's going to answer the top 10 questions about what to do when you finally land your dream UX job. So stay tuned for that one, because that's the question she gets asked the most at all the um, career fairs she goes to. <laughs> so she'll answer how to get your job. And then what do you do once you get once you start your job? So that's going to be really fun. She's great. Um, so thanks again to everyone who attended and um, happy new year. Happy 2023. And thank you and good night. Good night.